the chart of this voyaging writing. In traditional accounts, Eastern and Western, of the other world journey, there are gates through which the soul must pass. The soul is obliged to say the correct words in order to pass the wardens at each passage. I have already suggested that in women's metapatriarchal other world journeying, the wardens are the demonic powers of patriarchy, which assume ghostly forms, that is, are difficult to perceive, and function as noxious gases. Women who are able to name ourselves are therefore thereby empowered to name the demons at each passage. When we say their names, they, in effect, drop dead. To put it another way, the gases drop down, condense, into a merely messy puddle. These warden demons can be seen as personifications of the eight deadly sins of the fathers. It is significant that in the traditional listing of the deadly sins, Deception is not usually named. This non-naming is an indicator of the pervasive deceptiveness of male-constructed morality, which does not name its own primarily, primary deadly sin. Deception is, in fact, all-pervasive. It keeps us running in senseless circles. It sedates and seduces ourselves, freezing and fixing female process, enabling the fathers to feed upon women's stolen energy. The paternal parasites hiding their vamp vampirizing of female energy by deceptive posturing, which takes the form of processions, religious, military, judicial, academic, etc. For this reason, I choose to use the term processions to name the deception of the fathers. At every turn, the voyagers of this book encounter processions of demons wearing multi- Form masks. We exorcise them, expelling their deceptions from our minds, ousting these obstacles to our ecstatic process. This book is definitely meant to be read aloud. Processions both display and disguise the deadly sins of the fathers. The deception they engender glues the sins into conglomerates, reversing them, representing them as virtues. The following list, which is not accidentally, which not accidentally may resemble a sort of incantation, is a new naming of the eight deadly sins of the fathers. Although any listing is necessarily linear, it is clear that these malfunctions, male functions, are interconnected, that they feed into each other. Processions. The basic sin of phallocracy is deception, the destruction of process through patriarchal processions, which are frozen mirror images of spinning process. Professions. Deadly pride is epitomized in patriarchal professions, which condense the process of knowing into an inert and mystifying thing. Body of knowledge. Possession. Androcratic avarice is demonic possession of female spirit and energy, accomplished not only through political and economic means, but more deeply through male myth. Aggression, the ma malevolence of male violence, which is in fact usually dispassionate, is misnamed anger, ma masking the fact that women are the enemy against whom all patriarchal wars are waged and muting righteous female anger. Obsession, male lust specializes in genital fixation and fetishism. Reflecting a broken integrity of consciousness, generating masculine and feminine role constructs legitimated by sado-spiritual religion. Obsession. Assimilation. Gynocidal gluttony expresses itself in vampirism, cannibalism, the feeding, feeding upon the living flesh, blood, spirit of women, while tokenism disguises the devastation of the victims. Elimination. Misogynist envy tends inherently towards the elimination of all self-identified women, accomplishing this and through the reconception, reforming of some women into Athena-like accomplices, or 
by saying that some men can be women. Fragmentation, or I should say and or. Fragmentation, patriarchal sloth has enslaved women whose creativity is confined by mandatory menial labor and by deceptively glorified subservient social activities resulting in busy and enforced feminine sloth. Each of these sins of the fathers is more than a sum of abstractions. Each is incarnated in the institutions of patriarchy and in those who invent, control, and legitimate these institutions. Thus, women's journey of self-centering, becoming, passing through the gates of God, which block us from our own background, means confronting these deceptive incarnations, demons, naming them and naming their games. Our journeying past these watchful wardens is not linear. Amazing their mazes involves spinning through them at multiple times in multiple ways. Since their names are legion, there is not one simple once and for all name for all the demons. Their lecherous litanies are like passages of unholy scripture, which they repeat over and over again, and which have become, which have many levels of deception, not perceptible all at once. They become more perceptible as we learn to name ourselves, become ourselves more adequately. Concomitant with the amazing struggle, which is exorcism, is the ecstatic process of spinsters uncovering the labyrinth of our own unfolding becoming. Passing through the male-made mazes is not simply a preliminary lap of the journey. It makes way for and accompanies the ecstatic labyrinthine journey of survivors. In this book, I will chart describe this amazing and spinning voyage. That is, I will write about fundamental blind alleys of the master's maze which hide the passages of the labyrinthine way of ecstasy. I will be concerned with discovering the father's processions and with breaking away from them. The voyage will involve encounters with the other seven deadly sins, demons as well. These encounters are recurrent and in random order as the demons appear and reappear at various points, attempting to block our way. The voyage of this book moves through three passages. As the terrain changes, so also does the style of the explorer, her movement, her language. In the first passage, there is an exuberance of discovery as the voyager breaks through the barriers of obsolete myths which block vision. There is the constant surprise of seeing what is on the other side of the hill, and on all sides is the scope of vision, and on all sides is the scope of vision broadens and deepens. In the second passage, there is a soberness and focused attention as the explorer encounters the unnatural enemies of female being in their multiple postures of indecent exposure. There is a focused intensity as she marks the snares laid by the deadly game trappers, analyzing the archetypal atrocities in order to unmask the lethal intent of the death dealers. My dog is growling. In the third passage, having perceived the intent of the gynocidal gamester, she moves deeper into the other world which is her own time space. Her style reflects her newfound capacity to recognize their intent and its seemingly innocent and chillingly familiar manifestations, their chivalry, their help, their care, their art, their romance, their respect, their rewards, their blessings, their love. This new knowing, her beautific vision, encourages her to invent new modes of being, speaking, which are spooking, sparking, spinning. My charting and describing is inspired by many four sisters. Since all who have embarked on this journey are contemporaries, in the only sense that matters, the century or span of decades measured by patriarchal time in which his history places each of us is far less relevant than our own network of communication. All women who define our own living, defying the deception of patriarchal history, are journeying. We belong to the same time and we are four sisters to each other. Here in this volume, my charting and describing is inspired in a particular way by the words of one four sister, Virginia Woolf. 
who in her profoundly anti-patriarchal book, Three Guineas, asks, what are these ceremonies and why should we take part in them? What are these professions and why should we make money out of them? Where, in short, is it leading us, the procession of the sons of educated men? In this prophetic book, published in the 1930s, she shows connections among the absurd professional processions, displaying their deception, their morbidity, and meaninglessness. She advises us to break the ring, the vicious circle, the dance round and round the mulberry tree, the poison tree of intellectual harlotry, the circle of professions and the circle of processions and of professions is linked to possession. Of women's dilemma, she writes, behind us lies the patriarchal system, the private house with its nullity, its immorality, its hypocrisy, its servility. Before us lies the public world, the professional system with its possessiveness, its jealousy, its pugnacity, its greed. The one shuts us up like slaves in a harem. The other forces us to circle like caterpillars head to tail, round and round the mulberry tree, the sacred tree of property. It is a choice of evils. Each is bad. Yes, and each is part of the same system of patriarchal possession whose primary property is female life. The writing journeying of this book passes, spin, it spins through the phallocratic maze, yet the other side of this other world journeying is discovered at every turn. This is the ecstatic side. It involves speaking in various modes, spooking, sparking, spinning, although there is no one-to-one -one correlation between the exorcising and the ecstatic movements there is a kind of moving pattern, a spiraling of counterpoints, a harmony of hearing and speaking. Our acts of exercising are rites of passage by which we win the rites of passage. Our acts of exercising are rites, R-I-T-E-S, of passage, rites and passage are capitalized, by which we win the rites, R-I-G-H-T-S, of passage. In the process of encouraging and naming the male factors, malefactors, who freeze process into processions, hoard knowing within professions, and kill creativity by possession, I point out clues which, as they are recognized, disclose the living process which has been hidden, caricatured, captured, stunted, but never completely killed by the phallocentric sins. These clues point to a force which is beyond behind, beneath the patriarchal death march, an unquenchable gynergy. They serve as raw material for a process of alchemy. We transmute the base metals of man-made myth by becoming unmute, calling forth from ourselves and each other the courage to name the unnameable. So that concludes the introduction to gyne ecology the Metaethics of Radical Feminism. Um, we'll continue reading. This is definitely a book that you need to see and, re and read because there's lots of capitalization and split words. And um, I first read this book at Fordham University when I was a junior and a woman that I was in love with, had a class, she was assigned the book. I was not in any class that would have assigned this book, but it was, we would read it out loud. I was 20. I just want to point out Mary Daly. <laughs> She's wearing a Virginia Woolf shirt. Okay, so that's it for now.